The thing that we were waiting for all evening, which I'll be glad to introduce, is our Alice Smith lecture. It's an honor to, um, to have our lecturer because she is also one of our own alum. Uh, for years, uh, Barbara Seitz has valued hard work, enthusiasm, and talent as building blocks for leadership. But Barbara's come to believe that while those can certainly serve as the mortar, the true building blocks are the relationships we build with each other. As the 2015 Alice Smith Lecture, Barbara shares reflections about how keeping the focus on others holds the key to success. Barbara holds the rank of University Librarian and serves as the Associate Dean for Library Services for the Florida Gulf Coast University, one of the 12, Florida's 12 state universities. She's been a resident of Florida since 1964. Barbara moved to Lee County in 1995 and joined FGCU in 2006. Prior to that, she worked as the Executive Director of the Southwest Florida Library Network and the Tampa Bay Library Consortium. She's also been employed as a school librarian, an elementary school teacher, a law librarian, and as a business information specialist for Price Waterhouse. So she knows all the fields that we've been involved in. She also has adjuncted for us too. So we're, we keep encouraging uh, some of the folks that have had Barbara before that we would love to have her do that um, again. Dr. Steitz earned a BA in Education and MA in Library and Information Science, or Science from the University of South Florida and a PhD in Leadership and Education with a specialization in Human Resource Development from Barry University. She continues to serve in leadership roles with the Florida Library Association and the American Library Association, something that we encourage all of you to do. She provides consulting services and contributes scholarly work in the field. Most recently, she has projects in ethnographic research techniques to study the way students use space in academic libraries. Uh, she's also uh, working, so serving on the foundation for the redesign of the Florida Gulf Coast University's library space and services, and is particularly interested in developing, designing, assessing, and improving information literacy efforts, and well as in marketing, social media, and advertising library services. We are proud to be able to bring one of our own to speak to you as the 2015 Alice Smith Lecturer, Dr. Barbara Streitz. Seitz. so much for that great introduction. I am so honored to be here tonight. I, I'm just, so I'm almost speechless, I, but I will have a few words to say. <laughs> when I was invited to speak today, uh, it was suggested I, I talk about leadership, you know, about how getting involved and staying involved is important, and about how to influence and how to make differences in libraries and how that's worked for me throughout my career. I thought I might speak about those topics and talk about, along with talking about my pursuit of happiness and how that worked and how that didn't always work. Uh, I had a change in my thinking about it. I had a few changes along the way, so I thought I might take, talk about some of those changes. I also thought I might talk about uh, this, uh, this uh, was mentioned of how my focus uh, changed from um, looking for happiness to maybe providing some back happiness. I thought I would talk about how fo my focus is a little more on giving now than maybe it, it used to be when I was younger and working so hard to get a career started and get a family started. So some of the things I may touch on are also about how the next right thing seems to work really well for me. How chunking things into small pieces, just doing that next right thing is what's helped propel me forward. But first, uh, you heard a lot about me, but let me tell you a different story about me. There was no, there's just absolutely no reason that I should have had a successful career. Uh, there's not much in my background that would have predicted that someday I might be standing here in front of you, or someday I might assist new librarians or library students or faculty at a university. I, uh, I came from a family of, well, limited means, frankly. Uh, my family um, in the late 50s, not very few of my friends, well, in fact, none of my friends back in the late 50s had parents that were divorced, and I did. We didn't have much money, but I was lucky because I lived in an affluent community 
right outside of New York City. And I was exposed to great music and theater and art. And even though I was young, I think those things helped me form a foundation that served me for many, many years. But when I got to high school, I was in Florida, in a southern, south central part of Florida, in a very rural community, a little town called Lake Placid. Maybe some of you know where that is. Yeah? Oh, go. Yeah, yeah, Highlands County. Yay! <laughs> go Green Dragons. And uh, so, so I found myself in this small little community where young women at that time had very, very few opportunities. And there was no one in my family, no one in my school that was encouraging me to go to college, get some job, grow intellectually. That just wasn't my experience. So I, I didn't have a plan to attend college. I, in fact, I didn't really understand how people got to college. I didn't understand how they, how they paid for it. And I didn't have anybody I could ask about it, or I didn't think I did. So, but what I did know was that I didn't want to work in the local uh, citrus packing house. That work is backbreaking. It's also seasonal. It doesn't pay hardly anything. And it, what, it, what it meant was that a lot of women in our town every year would, around packing time, would work in these packing houses and their hands were purple for months at a time because of the ink that was stamped on all those oranges. And their hands were torn up and all. I knew I did not want to do that. So, uh, so there weren't many jobs. Uh, there were really no secretarial jobs or retail jobs. It, the, the few that there were, I wasn't going to get them. And so I just didn't have any. I didn't have any hope. I didn't have any um, perspectives, uh, prospects out there. But in my high school yearbook. Next to my photograph, it said, you know, the, the part where you write what you want to be when you grow up. I said, I wanted to be a research librarian. That's really pretty darn funny, because A, I did not know what a research librarian was. I had no clue what a research, I don't even know where I got the term, but somehow I, I did. Uh, so I wanted to be a research librarian. I'm living in this town, we didn't even have a public library, which we didn't. And it was really kind of sad because this was the winter home of Melville Dewey for his last three years of life. He died in this town, and there was no public library there. So where I got this idea about being a research librarian, I, I, I don't know. The only library in, in, in Lake Placid was a, a wall of used books in the women's club, and that was it. So what happened was I turned out to be this really independent cuss. That's what my mother called me, independent cuss. It wasn't a fond. <laughs> in fact, I moved out of my mother's home in my sophomore year of high school when I was 16 and lived on my own um, ever, ever since. I like to do what I wanted, when I wanted. I, I kind of still like that. <laughs> but I, I really bristled at authority. I bristled at school. I bristled at you know any kind of parental authority. And our school guidance counselor, she was less than thrilled with me. She really didn't... Um, I was not one of her potential successful students. <laughs> she was not guiding me anywhere but, but maybe out the door. I mean, she was probably happy on the days I didn't show up. So she wasn't thinking about mentoring me towards college. And to, but to pay the bills in high school, in, living on my own, I got a good job, believe it or not. And I worked for the Federal Land Bank half the day as a secretary. And so every day I go to work, I, and I was responsible. I was accurate. I was well-liked. Totally unlike the, my persona at school or, or, or at home. And that job really formed a lot of the basis of, uh, of um, the, the academic and the um, administrative work I, I do today. I, I learned to use um, calculators. Some of you are, are very, very young, so you won't remember these calculators that were big, like typewriters, and they had this platen on them that when you put the numbers in them by hand, uh, this is not electronic, these are manual, and it would go clunk, 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 clunk. <laughs> Anybody remember those big things? Yeah, Susan, yeah, all right. <laughs> and those first IBM Selectric um, typewriters that had the giant mag cards. But I got some good office skills anyway. I finally got to junior college, and there's a, there's a point to all this, so hold, hold, hang with me. I finally did get to junior college. It's a whole other story about how that happened. But I will say, um, give to scholarships. Scholarships change lives. I, I hope you can think about that. And for those of you that are new to librarianship, maybe you're a student or you're in your first five years of working, I know you don't have extra resources. Do you know $20 can help? 
you know, for us that have been worked a while, things with a few more zeros after them, good idea. Scholarships change lives. But anyway, um, I, I did then after that I commuted to USF and I, I got that bachelor's degree that you heard about a minute ago in education. And you've got to remember, right, back then women had two things that they could do. Oh, education, being a teacher, or? Yeah. Well, library maybe, but what was the other thing? Nursing. Nursing, nursing. mother of nursing. There was, there, was, there was education, which includes libraries and, and, and in my mind, and, and nursing. Those were the only two, so I picked, I picked education. And uh, I, I, couldn't be a, I couldn't be a librarian, so there were no libraries in my, in my town. So I began teaching for a local elementary school where I discovered a library. So I finally discovered a library in our town, and a few years later I got the MLS and began my library career. So the first thing I would say that impacts uh, careers, and many careers, and is a part of leadership, is simply perseverance, because that's what it was for me. It was perseverance. You know, Merriam-Webster calls it that quality that that quality that allows us to do something that just seems impossible, even though it's difficult. How many of you have been, uh, especially for you students, this must be really recent, just bone tired? It, you just don't want to write one more paper. Yeah, I see it. One more paragraph. How about one more post? Your little head want to go down on the keyboard? <laughs> but you did it anyway. You wrote that one more post, that one more paragraph. You know, you didn't, you didn't give up. You put putting one foot in front of the other, didn't you? Absolutely. Some of you have been my students. I know you did. I know you were, you were juggling. We were both juggling. You know, you're a lot like me. If you put that one foot in front of the other and you didn't give up and you kept going. And for those of us that have graduated from USF, obviously we kept going on those days that we didn't think we could. So the only way for me to get that MLS was to leave my teaching job at 3 p.m., get in the car, drive as fast as I could to get to that five o'clock class, because there was no online anything. <laughs> and I drove for two, two and a half hours, usually with two kids in the back seat, and I made it to class, and then I drove back home late at night and taught again in the morning. In those days, um, they were a little bit different, obviously, and um, thank goodness for a couple of professors that, shh, don't try this, do not do this, but they let me bring a kid or two with me and park them on the floor. With, a, with dinner and a coloring book. And my kids never made a sound. They did not make a peep. And that's where they sat for two or three hours while I took a class. It was the only way I could have gotten through. I had a daughter that had a terrible um, brain injury and I could not have left her. She, I couldn't have peeled her off my hip. I, I just wouldn't have. And I would have never finished school. So people, there were people that really made it possible for me to move forward um, in my career. But let me get back to what I said about perseverance. You see, I made a mistake about perseverance. Um, early on, you know, I often had these self-conversations uh, that sounded something like this. If only I could finish this degree, I could get a librarian job, and then everything would be great. Yeah. And later it went like this. If only I could hire another reference librarian, <laughs> my job would be so much easier, and that would be great. And then they sort of morphed, and they said things like, if only I could get a new husband, things would be great. <laughs> if only I could get a boyfriend, if only I could lose weight. If only I could get that car, or that house, things would be better. You know, fill in the blank. But you know that, that if only fill in the blank path to success, that method, it, it, really, it really didn't work for me long term. You know, and in, time, and in time, I realized that my pursuit of happiness was totally getting in the way of real life happiness. I couldn't show up in the present. I couldn't be there. I couldn't be right in the moment. I was always thinking about what was going to happen next. What could I do next? Where could I go next? And you know, in some ways, that perseverance served me well. Um, I moved through school quickly. My undergraduate degree, I did very quickly. Uh, my, my graduate degree, I did the water torture method, as I, I um, <laughs> described. But I did things quicker. I jumped higher but at a really, a really big price. I could not enjoy what was right in front of me. And so, change. And there's a little theme of change throughout what I want to say tonight. So it brings me, it bring, this brings me to a second characteristic that I believe is important for leaders to have, and that is openness, honesty. 
Some of you may have gone to the give and take book discussion today, or if you didn't go to the discussion, maybe you went to one of the virtual online ones, or maybe you still have the book and you haven't quite read it yet. But the um, One Book, One State book, uh, which is called Give and, give and Take by Adam Grant, um, is a great book. And he talks about in this book that the best way to influence people really may not be the first thing that comes to our minds. He tells us that research, well, research says that how we influence others is usually through either dominance or prestige. And when we establish dominance in, uh, with others, it's because people see us as strong, assertive, um, authoritative. When people see us as, when they give us that, that, that moniker of, of, pre of prestigious, they see us, uh, maybe they admire us, or they respect us. But what Adam Grant says is, um, he says he's, he's not so sure about all of that. He really challenges some of those kinds of ideas. And he talks about that the importance of assertiveness, you know, it, it may not be so assertive. When I grew up, um, and, and remember, I, I, I know, I have a six in front of my, my number of my birthdays now. So it was a while ago. But, but when I grew up, you know, we were trying to break into a man's world, and so we were trying to act like men. We even dressed like men. In the 80s, we had these suits that we wore these little ties, and oh my gosh, you know, yeah, never mind that. I'll get off track if I start talking about that. So, um, so anyway, Adam Grant talks about um, that, that this key to persuasion isn't necessarily delivering these assertive, strong um, uh, kind of uh, talks. He, talk, he, he mentions that sometimes using le powerless speech can be the way of, of, uh, of a leader speaking that, that can be powerful. He talks about using um, words like, hmm, I'm not sure, May maybe, this might be a bad idea, but, and that isn't the kind of conversation, that isn't the kind of language that I was taught in, you know, um, in my imaginary business school, um, how, how to communicate to, to leaders. But he says that really works. And that brings me back to that idea of being open and honest. Early in my career, I was really terrified of letting my colleagues, letting you all know what I really thought. I was terrified that they would find out exactly how inexperienced I was and that I wasn't an expert. I wasn't an expert. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to know that. I was worried that if I asked questions that they might discover that I needed help and that might lead them to perceive me as weak or inadequate. And what I really eventually learned was that by getting more comfortable, by showing my true level of knowledge, that that's when I began to get that valuable experience. But boy, did I pay a price. Back in uh, 1989, I found myself in charge of putting together a program for the Florida and Caribbean chapter of the Special Library Association. It was uh, called Running Your Library Like a Business. And I was a year out of library school, if you can imagine that. A year out of library school, I never developed a special event other than my kids, five, you know, my five-year-old kid's birthday party. I knew nothing about special events, so I'm in charge of this thing. And so given that, given that strong event planning background that I had, uh, I decided, and I'll tell you it was me, independent cuss, remember that part? I decided that I was going to have a multi-day, because I had, I had the ability to make, to kind of craft this way I wanted to, I was going to have a multi-day conference with co uh, consecutive uh, events all throughout the day. Oh, and I was going to invite national speakers too. This was going to be great. Fancy hotel, wonderful catering. <laughs> Yeah, well, you see where this is going. So um, that was my vision, and I, I did. I worked really hard. And these national speakers, they started saying yes, they would do it. People like Miriam Drake and Barbara Quinn. I'm assuming older folks may remember the, those those people. And they they said yes, and the registration started coming in. And I had to pull this thing together, and I did not know how. But I wouldn't let anybody know. And I got more and more upset. I got more and more nervous. I was totally on edge. I was feeling totally about to jump out of my skin. And then things changed. And that was another turning point for me. Thankfully, out of desperation, and for what may have been the first time in my entire life, 
I opened up to a friend about what was going on and how I didn't know what I was doing and the stress I was under. I was, you gotta know, I was in a pretty wretched state to admit defeat. That was just not my, my personality. So guess what? She happened to be a marketing director at this large corporation and uh, she knew all about special events and how to do those things. And she picked up the phone, she made a few calls, we got the hotel, we got the flights, we got this, we got that. She knew all about hotel contracts and uh, some meals and a flight, blah, blah, blah. It was all, all done and it was very simple for her. And I, and I learned a lot about special events planning from her at that point. But the most valuable point, the most valuable point, and this turning point in my career was I could finally begin to crack that door of being open and honest about who I really was. And I was able to begin to say, I don't know, and it was okay. So as I learned to be more open and honest, as I began to let people see the warts and the, and the wrinkles and to be willing to ask great people to help me, I saw how being authentic, which sometimes appeared, you know, included appearing vulnerable, uh, was far more powerful than the steel magnolia exterior that I had built and that I thought was who I needed to be. Effective leaders are honest and open with their communication and employ communication strategies such as asking questions and listening more than they more than they talk. So I have a question for you. Okay. Just out of curiosity, what are your plans to join or to renew your membership to the USF School of Information's alumni group. What are your plans? Now this isn't really a commercial for them. I have some point to this. By asking you that one question, oh, well, it is kind of a little commercial. Okay, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By asking you that one question, the give and take author, Adam Grant, he said, uh, I've just increased the odds that you'll join or renew your membership by 41%. Let me know that works. <laughs> it illustrates, I just wanted to illustrate the power of, of asking questions because, you know, we receive, I don't know about, I, well, I do know about you. I was going to say, I don't know about you, but I kind of think I do, and at least about this. Is we receive so many robocalls. We watch so many commercials every week. We get so much junk, junk email. I mean, we're really wary of, of being duped, right? Imagine I had just said to you, uh, you should join the Alumni Association. Get your pen, write them a check today. You know, some of you might have done that, but some of you, I suspect, would be thinking, oh, I don't know, we'll see, I don't know. And it, it may, there may be that feeling of, of pushback, a little bit of pressure. But by asking your plans, instead of telling you what I think you should do, I, you know, I still get to plant the seed. You know, I, there may be no, there, there's no resistance with that. I just get to plant the seed. And I'm blowing my cover because I'm telling you what, what I was doing. But think about that. If I think there was one takeaway from that book for me, and this is, a, 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 this is just recent for me. I'm talking a little bit about the past, about how leadership worked for me and what I've learned. But some of my real recent lesson is this one, about asking those questions. Instead of telling people what you want them to do, sometimes just asking them what their plans are can plant those kinds of seeds. Effective leaders ask questions, and they plant seeds. So I've talked about a bit about perseverance, about not losing sight of the joy and, and being in the day and embracing honesty and openness and asking questions and how I believe they're all critical to um, career success. I want to end my talk tonight by uh, just talking a little bit about relationships and building networks. As you heard earlier uh, in my introduction, I really did spend years um, uh, valuing hard work, I still value hard work. Uh, I value enthusiasm. I, I thought that they were the building blocks of leadership and they were everything. And what I've learned is they're still very, very important, but they're not everything. It's that mortar that goes around those bricks that really turn them into a wall and turn them into the house, that house. And true, that, true, that mortar, the true building blocks, are the relationships that we have with one another. The relationships that we build in our offices, in our homes, and what we're doing here tonight, and what we'll do um, with each other for over the next couple days. So to, to, to begin to wrap things up, I wanted to tell you about this article that I read from uh, Inc. Magazine. There's an article that uh, posted uh, nine habits of people who build extraordinary relationships. And I want to 
just share just four of them with you. I knew you were just saying, oh my God, nine? We have to do nine? <laughs> but they're four, and they're rather, they're rather short. The first habit was, uh, it's take the hit. Imagine this, a, a faculty member gets mad, a library patron complains about a staff member, a coworker feels slighted. What the article said is that sometimes, whatever the issue and regardless of who is actually at fault, some people step in and take the hit. They're willing to accept the criticism or abuse because they know they can't handle it. And they know that maybe, just maybe, the other person can't take the hit. The second habit they talked about was step in without being asked. I bet most of you feel it's easy to help when, when you know, you're asked to do something. I, I know I do. If you ask me to do something, a lot of times it's, it's, it's an easy yes. It's not so easy no, and that's a whole other speech about how to get to no. But I know I, can, I say, I, it's not so hard to say uh, yes when you ask me. But not as many people offer to help before they've been asked. And even when that is when a little help will provide the most assistance, Jeff Hayden, the, um, the author of this, this Inc. article with the habit, says, people who build extraordinary relationships play close, pay close attention so that they can tell when others are struggling. Then they offer to help. But not in general, not in that general, is there something I can do to help sort of way. These kind of people actually pay attention and they come up with specific ways that they can help. That way they can push past that obligatory, no, no, I'm fine. And they actually find things to do and to help to roll up their sleeves and, and, and dig in so that they can make a difference in, in another person's life. How many of you have had somebody make a real difference in your life by just lending that one hand, just five minutes, an hour, 